Hello everyone, this is the CircuitPython Weekly for November 14, 2022. It's the time of week where we get together to talk about all things CircuitPython. I'm Jeff, or Jepler, and I'm sponsored by Adafruit to work on CircuitPython. CircuitPython is a version of Python designed to run on tiny little computers known as microcontrollers. CircuitPython development is primarily sponsored by Adafruit, so if you want to support Adafruit and CircuitPython, consider purchasing, from, pr consider purchasing your hardware from Adafruit.com. And if you're international, especially, we've got a list of uh, official resellers at the bottom of the storefront page. So check that out if you're in another country besides the U.S. And that's still a big help when you buy from our um, official distributors. Anyway, this meeting uh, is hosted on the Adafruit Discord server. So if you are watching or listening after the fact, we'd love you to join us on Discord by going to adafru.it slash discord. Uh, we hold this meeting in the CircuitPython Dev Text channel and the CircuitPython Voice channel. Uh, but whether you are joining us through your web browser or through an app, there's people active all around the world, all times of day. So just uh, stop in and talk to somebody, get to know us. Uh, this meeting typically happens on Mondays at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific, except when it coincides with a U.S. holiday. In the notes document, there's a link to a calendar you can view online or add to your favorite calendar app. And that's really the best way to keep on top of meeting times. Uh, although we also send notifications about upcoming meetings via Discord. To receive these notifications, ask us to add you to the CircuitPythonistas Discord role. Uh, as I mentioned, there is a notes document that accompanies the meeting. The notes document, when you're watching it after the fact, contains timestamps to go along with the video, so you can easily skip to the parts that interest you the most. The meeting runs anywhere from 45 to 60 minutes, and so we find it's helpful to have the option to skip around. Then after the meeting, uh, I will post a link to the meeting notes for the next week. And uh, we invite you anytime during the week, up to when we start the meeting, or up to when you are talking, uh, to go ahead and add your notes about what you're up to to hug reports and status updates that we will go through uh, during the meeting. So the structure of this meeting, after the intro, we've got five parts. Next up is Community News, which is a look at all things Python, CircuitPython, and Python on hardware in the community, and a preview of our fine Python on Microcontrollers newsletter. Next up after that, we head to the state of CircuitPython, the libraries, and Blinka, where we take a statistical overview of the entire project by the numbers, separate from what we're all up to. And then third, and the first round robin section, is called Hug Reports. Hug Reports is an opportunity to highlight the good things folks are doing, taking the time to recognize the awesome folks in our community. And you guys are awesome. The fourth part is status updates. It's really the meat of the meeting. Status updates is an opportunity to sync up on what we've all been up to. So you are invited to take a couple of minutes and talk about what you've done since the last meeting and what you'll be up to until the next meeting. And then the last part uh, is called In the Weeds. If we've got a longer discussion or a little bit of uh, public decision making to do, this is the time for it. Uh, whether it is something that you identified during the week, something you identified during status updates, uh, I just ask that if at all possible you add that to the document um, before I reach that section so we know whether there are items to discuss or not. And that covers how the meeting will go. And so with that, I will scroll back to community news and read you off a preview of the newsletter. So uh, first up, I can take credit for sending this in to Anne. I may not have been the only one, but Arduino is planning to support the use of MicroPython and introduces Arduino Lab for MicroPython. Arduino has partnered with Damian George to use MicroPython on a number of Arduino products. So this new alpha release uh, is a rebranded fork of work done by, I apologize for butchering your name, Marillo Polizzi on an IDE which has a similar look to the current I Arduino IDE. And there's a link to the Arduino blog and to Arduino Labs. Next up, PyScript updates, the Bytecode Alliance, PyODied, and MicroPython. Earlier this year, Anaconda unveiled PyScript to enable users to create Python applications in the browser. In order for PyScript to succeed, Anaconda must make strategic investments in both the project itself and its core technology dependencies. To that end, PyScript has been improving its technical foundations over the past few months. Okay, that's just a bunch of marketing speak. But what is actually really exciting about this is they've got a version of MicroPython that runs in the browser. 
Um, and so it's just about 300 kilobytes to load and then MicroPython starts running in your browser in a tenth of a second. So it's like instead of a JPEG image at the top, you can load an entire Python runtime and then code your web logic in Python, which I just think that's super exciting. Um, and somebody should do a CircuitPython version of this. Um, anyway, that's my excitement about that little project. Um, then the uh, newsletter continues with a bunch of projects just by people in the community. And I picked only one of them, but there are so many cool ones in there. So in a minute, I'm going to ask you to subscribe to the newsletter. This is why if you want like 10 more like this, just go and subscribe right now. Uh, quote, converting C code to CircuitPython led me down a rabbit hole with how display functions are handled. Had to consult the source code and some great Adafruit learning guides slash examples. A most enjoyable adventure, writes the Flying Kipper via Twitter. And uh, it looks like some kind of cool, uh, is that a battery gas gauge kind of thing? I'm not sure what it is, but love seeing the display IO projects. It really helps show what CircuitPython can do. And uh, anyway, lots more projects. So the CircuitPython weekly newsletter is a community run newsletter emailed. It, it is a CO2 meter. It says CO2 right there. Thank you, Anne. <laughs> Um, it's a community run newsletter emailed every Tuesday. The complete archives are at adafruitdaily.com slash category slash circuit Python. So you can get an idea of what you're in for, but basically we really want to highlight the latest Python and hardware related news from around the web, including circuit Python, Python and MicroPython. And we want to hear from you, whether you ran across a news story, whether you did a project. Uh, you can a edit next week's draft on GitHub and submit a pull request with the changes. You can tag your tweet with hashtag CircuitPython on Twitter, or you can email cpnews at adafruit.com. And uh, in our internal meeting, we were discussing uh, lots of people share their projects on Discord. And because to view messages on Discord, you have to sign in with the Discord app and join the Adafruit Discord, that doesn't produce a great way for us to to turn that shared project into a article or a feature on the newsletter um, using things like Twitter, where you can post up some images, uh, whatever you feel about Twitter, I'm not hot on it, uh, is better than Discord. Um, but um, what about Mastodon posting, asks David. I think Mastodon posting is probably great because you've got a chance for some text, some links, some pictures that anyone can view without signing in. Uh, but I don't think you can tag it hashtag CircuitPython and get the same reach. So you'd want to email cpnews at adafruit.com or uh, put it in that pull request on GitHub, which I think Anne would love for you to do because uh, she does a ton of work putting together the newsletter each week. And uh, just to, to reduce the amount of work she does on an individual item, but uh, yeah, so email that Mastodon link to Anne, and we would love to include that in the newsletter. And uh, I'm on Mastodon. Um, I saw Scott, and I think I saw you, Anne. I saw Katni. I saw Dan. So some of us are dipping our toes in that. But anyway, I'm getting a little bit off of the track because that wraps up community news. It doesn't quite wrap up community news because the other thing you need to do is go to adafruitdaily.com and actually subscribe to the newsletter. Um, we don't uh, sell that email, email list. It's disconnected from your store account. We just use it to send you the newsletters that you specifically subscribe to. And there are a couple other ones. There's an IoT monthly newsletter that's pretty cool. Anyway, check it out. But we are moving on to the state of CircuitPython, the libraries, and Blinka. So, this report contains information from the previous seven days. It's a report that's run in the middle of the night US time. So like stuff from today is not included in this report. And sometimes things that happen on the boundary just get missed because of the way we generate it. So anytime we appear to overlook your contribution, it's we're blaming the computer on that one. Uh, but we had a big number of pull requests merged overall across the project with 81 pull requests merged by 25 authors. Um, and some of the names that uh, I don't see as often or uh, are new to me are M. McGowan, Alan Tor, Crotwell, Dav Clark, B. Born CR, K. 
Cam Davison Pilon, Drone CZ, Gruma, and Kyle McCreary. And maybe TC Franks, that's not a super familiar one. So uh, thank you very much to all those authors, whether you are a first time author or a repeating author, we couldn't make CircuitPython the thing that it is without you all. Um, and you're making your projects better and you share it back with us and we're just extremely grateful for that. We're also grateful to our reviewers who are people who in a more official capacity are uh, making decisions about whether to accept pull requests. Um, and those are uh, Maker Melissa, Eva Harada, Tectric, Brent RU, Jepler Foamy Guy, Dan Halbert, and Katney. And also a big thanks to everybody who's not in an official capacity but is able to give us useful feedback on pull requests like I tested it and it worked and all that stuff. And Katney will talk more about all that stuff. I have one more stat and then we will hear from Scott. So issues wise across the whole project we had 24 closed issues by 10 people and 37 open by 16 people. Uh, we've had a pretty good downward trend lately so seeing a little bit of an uptick is not a huge deal um, and you know we just keep working through those issues and closing those issues and that is really heartening to see as well as just the range of numbers of people participating those people filing issues those people uh, who are authors of pull requests uh, those people who are re reviewing and commenting we're really grateful to all of them for the work that they're doing uh, but now, Scott, it's your chance to uh, make your voice heard and tell us about the core of CircuitPython this week. Hello. Um, so I don't have much context on this, so that's, don't expect any uh, color commentary, but I'll, I'll read it off here. So we've got 16 pull requests merged from 12 different authors, which is good. Um, a number of folks that I have not seen before, uh, given that I haven't been looking for the last 12 weeks as well. Um, Ed McGowan, I do recognize Atalantor is new. Um, Kyle McCreary is new. Beborn CR is new as well, so thank you to them. We had two reviewers, Jeff and Dan, so thank you, Jeff and Dan. We have 28 open pull requests, which seems a little high to me, um, but it looks like 13 are drafts, so I'm excited to dig in and see what all those are. Issues-wise, we had 11 closed issues by four people and nine opened by six people for a total of 569 open issues. Um, there are seven active milestones. 8.0 has 30 open issues. That's going to be of particular interest for me. Uh, interesting, there's a new category, third parties. That sounds interesting. And there are four issues not assigned to milestone. Uh, and I think those are the highlights. All right, thank you, Scott. It's good to hear from you today. Um, Thanks, Jeff. And with that, I will hand the baton off to Kenny to tell us about the libraries and more about contributing to CircuitPython. Thanks, Jeff. This section applies to all of the Adafruit CircuitPython libraries, which is everything that starts with Adafruit underscore CircuitPython underscore, as well as a few extras such as our cookie cutter and the community bundle. Across all of those repositories, we had 58 pull requests merged, from 10 different authors, including a number of the new folks that Jeff read off earlier, and seven reviewers. Uh, let's see, fully one, two, three, four, five of those PRs are over two weeks old, with the oldest being 190 days old. So it's really great to see that we're still getting through some older PRs. And that leaves us with 38 open pull requests. We had 11 issues closed by four people and 26 opened by nine people. Uh, so we're up quite a bit, and that leaves 586 open issues. 99 of those are labeled good first issue. If you're interested in contributing to CircuitPython on the Python side of things, check out circuitpython.org contributing. You'll find all of this information and more, including a list of open pull requests, uh, the list of open issues, and some library infrastructure issues. If you want to start reviewing, check out the open pull requests. If you have the hardware, test the PR. If you don't, take a look at the code, let us know what you see, um, leave a comment and let us know that you did that and that's still incredibly helpful. Um, if you, uh, and once you're comfortable with that, you can, we can talk about leveling you up to the review team. If you're interested in contributing code or documentation, check out uh, the open issues. 
If you're new to everything, Good First Issue is a great place to start. We also have a guide on contributing to CircuitPython using Git and GitHub, and we're always available on Discord to um, help you through the, the first steps. So don't let that part intimidate you. We want you to be able to contribute in a way that works for you. Um, and next up, we have Library PyPI Weekly Download Stats. Super excited about this. I will probably say that for the next few weeks. Um, so the total library stats, which is uh, PyPI downloads over 323 libraries, is 178,753. And then there is a list of the top 10 PyPI downloads, uh, or libraries by PyPI downloads. Um, bus devices but basically, and requests are probably both top uh, for the foreseeable future. They're, they're used by a lot of other libraries, and uh, so when you download Blinka, um, the, often that'll come with it. Um, and then uh, there's really no um, surprises in the rest of it. So take a look at that uh, list in the notes if you're interested. And um, there is a file which I will actually have added to the to the notes here um, in the in the next however long. There's a file on the bundle, the Adafruit community or Adafruit Circuit Python bundle that contains the entire list. So if that's the sort of data you're interested in, we do have it in a in an easily accessible place. In case you in terms want to know of what is the the library with the fewest downloads, the saddest, loneliest library that deserves yes. love and attention and affection. Or the very newest library. Or the very newest library. Um, so in terms of library updates in the last seven days, speaking of new libraries, there are none. Um, and in terms of updated libraries, there is a short list, which I will not read off. Um, and uh, there's been um, there's been a number of updates to the library section in this in this set of notes. Um, we're basically trying to get data that we used to have, which is the PyPI download stuff, um, and get you know more data that we're interested in um, added here. So you'll you'll see that there was a couple changes here. Um, I don't foresee very many more, um, but it was important to us to get that stuff back and. Uh, into the brains of other people. And that's what I've got. All right, thank you. And last up to round out this section, I will read about Blinka. Blinka is a CircuitPython compatibility layer for MicroPython, Raspberry Pi, and other single board computers. Um, so basically, you want to run your CircuitPython code anywhere, Blinka is your best friend. And within that project, we had a really large number of pull requests relative to usual of seven pull requests by five authors and four reviewers. Uh, so thank you to Happy Me 531 which I don't remember seeing in the above list of um, authors. That's interesting. Um, and Cam Davison Pilon, as well as some of the usual suspects. And thank you to our reviewers. Uh, that leaves four open pull requests. Three out of the four have been open over a year, and one has been open 18 days. Issues-wise, there were two closed by two people and two open by two people, so they are at issue parity within the Blinka project, leaving 84, 84 excuse me, open issues. The number of PyPI downloads in the last week was 27,000, and the number of PyWheels downloads in the last month was 10,000. And they are hovering just below an important milestone with the number of supported boards at 98, not counting MicroPython boards. All right, that finishes the state of CircuitPython, the libraries, and Blinka, and brings us to Hug Reports. Um, as I was saying before, Hug Reports are a time to acknowledge the positive things that are happening in the community around us, whether it was someone who helped you out or something that you observed, whether it was on Discord or GitHub or Mastodon, Twitter, uh, it's all fair game. Uh, we just want to lift each other up for a minute um, and yeah, recognize the good stuff. So I will start it out and then we will go through the document in order, which is roughly alphabetical order. So I have a big hug report to Lady Ada and PT. Welcome to a new adventure. Please carve out the time and space you need for it. And to editorialize for a second, speaking just for myself, uh, while it's easy to feel close to those two uh, because of the time we spend on their YouTube broadcasts, they really deserve their privacy about this stuff, um, especially the new one who who doesn't have any, uh, you know, choice in, in what their parents do. Uh, they deserve privacy, so just be mindful of boundaries and think about the difference between 
your actual friends and these people that you know on the internet. And I, I've seen, it's not that I've seen anybody acting inappropriately, it's just, it's important to reflect on that, um, I think, now when they're visibly carving out the privacy that they want for themselves. Anyway, enough said about that. Uh, Katni, thank you for trying to organize a time for ch to chat last week, even though it didn't work out in the end. A uh, hug report to you, Scott. It's happy to see you back, and I know you're working hard to find that new balance in your life, um, and I think you're doing a good job. Uh, Dan, thanks for being a fond of information this weekend about solder flux, and also hug reports to DJ Devin, David uh, Glode, and Bill 88T for commiserating about using the wrong stuff. Uh, so check if you're using a solder flux containing zinc chloride on your electronics. If you are, throw that stuff out. It's meant for pipes and will ruin your PCBs and components. Um, I didn't really know about this except peripherally, but Dan was really helpful when this came up on Discord over the weekend. Uh, thank you to Mark for providing some tips about small fonts for the project that I'm going to do on the BFF, uh, NeoPixel BFF board, hopefully this week to DroneCZ on GitHub for sticking through the PR process for a new board. There were some bumps, but they got it done. And thanks to Microdev and Dan for noticing that a problem that was shared by DroneCZ and BBornCR that they ran into while adding a new board, it was due to an incorrect gitignore file. And um, I said, uh, now we need a PR to fix it, but I actually added the PR earlier this morning. Um, so hopefully that will be resolved soon and not bite anybody else. And that's it for me. Uh, I'll go to Dan in a moment, but now I'll read Seagrover's notes. A hug report to Lamore and Phil for taking the next step to upgrade their maker environment. Can't wait to see the new release. And a group hug to the team and community for being, well, awesome. All right, Dan is up now, but then it's Deshipu. Okay, thank you, Jeff. Uh, thanks to Scott for um, a nice... Uh, catch-up conversation about family and work. I saw the baby in action. That was great. And welcome back. Uh, thanks to Jeff and Microdev for reviews on CircuitPython last week. And thanks to Katni um, for um, organizing our internal meetings uh, while Lamore and PT are away and for working on code of conduct updates and update mechanisms. Okay, thanks. All right, go ahead, Dishapu, and then I'll read some notes from some folks. Uh, so I haven't been paying enough attention recently to Circuit Python, so all I can do is I go back. All right, no need to be bashful. We understand everybody has other things that go on in their life, and we're happy that you could stop by today. All right, uh, I've got some notes to read, and then next after that will be Foamy Guy. But now, DJ Devon 3 writes, a hug report to Naradoc for going above and beyond, helping me with the TR cowbell. A hug for Foamy Guy for streaming while reviewing my PR. I learned a lot and made my PR better. It was extremely helpful. Would love to see more pull request reviews get live streamed. And last, a hug for Mr. and Mrs. Ada for joining the wonderful and wacky world of parenthood. And then I've got notes from David Glode. Um who has a hug report for Lady Ada and Mr. Lady Ada for the great reveal of their secret family size increase and a hug to Dan for helping me figure out that the flux I was using was not for electronics. All right, it's time for Tim. And then next after that is Katni. Um, yeah. All right. Thanks, Jeff. Um, echoing a couple people who have mentioned, uh, welcome back to Scott. It's great to see you back around. Um, hug report for PT and Lady Ada for the great news they shared this week. Uh, hug report, thank you to C. Grover for hanging out during many of my streams and dropping little bits of Python knowledge. Um, most immediately earlier today, uh, C. Grover shared some syntax around slicing that I didn't know about. Uh, it was great to always be learning things. Um, and then uh, group hug to everybody. Thanks. All right. And Katni, you are up next. And then I'll read notes from Melissa. So I have a short list here. Um, hug report to Liz for swapping hosting the meeting uh, next week. It'll be her first time hosting, which uh, bumped it up by two weeks. Um, she was happy to do that. She had some other stuff going on the week she was supposed to host anyway. Um, but I have some 
very exhausting things going on over the weekend, and uh, I'm trying to uh, be good at respecting my own limitations. Um, thanks to my partner Rose for helping with Python code over the weekend. Uh, to Tactric for setting, getting CI set up for me on a personal project, including reuse, uh, licensing, Pylint, and Black. Um, to Foamy Guy, a belated hug report for helping out with the initial code for the same project. Uh, to Tectric for handling all of the Pylint update woes on Learn. And to Eva for helping out with the Pylint stuff. Sorry. Um, to Toddbot for explaining wire in Arduino, both standalone and with regards to board.stemma underscore I squared C. Um, turns out in in the grand scheme of things, they're they're very similar. Um, but wire does some some specific stuff, none of which I understood until Toddbot explained it. Um, I have a hug report from the original author of the bundle PR that was merged this week. Um, he's called Dav Clark. Uh, Hug report to Tim, Dan, and Jeff for finishing up the documentation PR. Um, he actually thought he'd closed it, uh, and it he was so he was surprised and thankful to whomever uh, got it merged, and it was actually all three of those folks. Um, to hug report to everyone else that I forgot. I know I'm forgetting something. Apologize if it, if it turns out to be you and a group hug. Thank you, Katni. Uh, next up, I am going to read notes from another of people. A number of people but it looks like uh, Paul you're up after that group so uh, maker Melissa writes a hug report to me for getting me unstuck by reviewing a platform detect PR on short notice so I could review other people's PRs uh, she also has a hug report for Carter for helping with a particularly perplexing funhouse board issue in support a hug to Scott for making it back a hug report to Tectric for fixes to the Adafruit blanket display IO library and finally the group hug. Next up, Mark, aka Gamblor, uh, has a hug report for me, Jepler, for the NeoPixelate library and information about how it and the RP2040 NeoPixels work. A hug to Le Lady Ada and PT for their great news and a group hug. And last in this little group of people who are text only or missing the meeting, Microdev has a group hug and a hug for Scott. Happy to see you back and belated congratulations. All right, so we've got next Paul, then a note for me to read, and then Scott. Go ahead, Paul. Thanks, Jeff. I just have a group hug for everybody. Thanks. All right. And Tammy makes things as text only today, but is there in the text chat. Um, and it has a hug for Katni for several recent conversations, one for PT and Lady Ada, Lady Ada for the great news, and a group hug for the community. And that brings us to Scott, a.k.a. Tan Nude, if anybody remembers this guy. <laughs> uh, thanks, Jeff. Um, first, I just wanted to say a huge thank you to everybody, both in the Secret Python community and at Adafruit. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I just took 12 weeks to watch my uh, seven-month-old, now seven-month-old, <laughs> Um, taking paternity slash bonding leave. I really, I, I realized that bonding is a good way to put it. It's definitely, we bonded over the 12 weeks, so it's been really great. And it's been well worth it, and I hope that uh, PT and Lady Ada take as much time as they possibly can to, to spend with their new little one, or their coming little ones as well. Um, and then I just wanted to say a hug report. So, I should also caveat that I'm way not uh, caught up on email, so there's a lot of people I'm missing. But one thing I did catch was that the Pico W has made a ton of progress over these 12 weeks, uh, thanks to Jeff largely. So uh, hug report to Jeff for, for taking that on. Awesome to see all the progress that you've, you've made. And uh, I'm also very personally excited. I don't have to jump into that when I get back, too. So uh, thanks, Jeff, again for doing that. I, I really appreciate that. Um... It was definitely a group effort. There have been a number of other people um, consistently adding things within CircuitPython, but also MicroPython and the Pico SDK were amazing resources, and we reused a lot more code than uh, anybody thought we would, and that made it pretty easy. Awesome. Um, anyway, but uh, I'm going to read notes from Tectric, and then we will round out the section with Moto Timo. So Tectric writes a hug report for Eva and Katni for all the help with patching things after last week's PyLint and CI upgrade. To Ketney again for always interesting discussion, including one about open source licensing. 
A hug to Dan, Foamy Guy, and Maker Melissa for help in diagnosing and fixing an issue with building the contributing page for CircuitPython.org. A hug for Naradoc for pointing me towards Disco Tool. Though I didn't end up using it, it was great inspiration for what I'm working on. And a group hug. All right, and Moto Timo, uh, please tell us what's up. Yeah, I just want to welcome Scott back and uh, thanks Foamy Guy for doing all the the live streams, even though I've been busy and haven't been able to watch them live. Really excited. I just found out in this meeting about Leda Ada and PT. And uh, I'm just so thankful for Ada Fruit for having uh, bonding leave. I mean, it's just great that people support that. And I think that's that just shows what a great company it is. And group hug to everybody. Uh, I wish I could be more involved, but I I just love this, this community. It's awesome. Well, we're glad you could join us today. So thank you for that. All right, and with that, we will head on to status updates. So as I said earlier, um, it's the time to let us know what you've been up to, primarily within the CircuitPython community. Um, although we also love to hear some stuff from outside, it can really uh, you know, give us an insight into who you are when you share what you're up to in your life. Um, so anyway, just you know, now and then, throw something in. Um, I will start uh, to show how it goes, and then we will go through the document as it is. So last week, I played with LED strips a lot uh, while working on a prototype for the Feather RP2040 Scorpio. It works really good, um, makes a bunch of pretty colors, and I've been working on making it faster. And for my status updates, I'm trying something new today. I made my status update largely from my GitHub activity logs. I'm only going to read a subset of what's in the document because it ended up a little bit long. Uh, so I did a number of things that were around optimizing the um, pixel buff in the core and the LED animation library and even proposing a new core class that would be called pixel map that would replace the pixel map within the Adafruit LED animation library and be faster. So a number of things were relative to that. and. Just before the meeting, I was comparing uh, my original script with uh, eight comet animations on eight LED strips with the um, Scorpio, and it went from being able to achieve about 40 frames per second to about 95 frames per second when putting together all these different optimizations. Um, and that's with, I think it's uh, 240 LEDs. So it's like, n now that we've got this ability to drive a lot of LEDs, we can improve the efficiency of the rest of the code um, and just make the animations more fluid or give you more time to do other things in between animation updates and just improve the capabilities. And so I've been excited to kind of find some of those low hanging fruit and actually make improvements. And hopefully we can work on getting those all incorporated. Those, these, a lot of these are open pull requests. They're not merged yet. They will need changes and revision. Um, for the quality of the code, um, Dan and I had both noticed that some things about the Pico W were like making us make changes in the parts of the code that are supposed to be independent of the individual board or microcontroller. And I put in a pull request to hide that back where it needs to be. Um, next up, recently Python 3.11 came out and we started using it on GitHub Actions. But within the core, we found that we encountered uh, errors during the build process. And I put in a pair of PRs so that we will be able to return to using quote, the current version of Python uh, for building CircuitPython, which is really good. Uh, Moto Timo says we need a Blinkit with a heart emoji, and that is 100% true. Um, so someone please do that, and Katni can add it to our emojis. Anyway, back to me. I put in a pull request to update Microlab to version 6.0.1. We were at version 5 point something before, so I do not know what the updates are specifically, but it's great to keep up to date with that project that enables a lot of cool stuff. Um, on the Raspberry Pi Pico and RP2040, I tried to implement a function called port idle until interrupt, uh, which would make sleeping work a little better, maybe save a tiny bit of power, uh, but it's tricky and people need to check it out and test it before we merge it. Um, I have on this list that I added the NeoPixel 8 library to the CircuitPython bundle, but that may have been over a week ago. Um, a pull request that was merged, I think, 
today was the ability to read the voltage monitor on Pico W, which was one of these dwindling numbers of things that uh, were not yet implemented. Uh, so I was happy to see that able to go in. Um, and within an Adafruit CircuitPython issue, I helped uh, a user understand the distinction between an operation with star star and math.pow and why one was acting more efficiently than the other. All right, so that's what I've been up to. It feels like it was a little bit of a long list. This week, um, I am going to write a scrolling text example for the Neo BFF, which is an add-on for Cutie Pie form factor boards. Uh, we'll just scroll a simple text message across it, uh, the 5x5 NeoPixel LEDs. I'm doing some final checks on three prototype boards, and I'm going to draft CircuitPython board definitions for them. They're going in as draft because these boards might be revised one more time before they go into production, or, you know, who knows what will happen, because they're not ready yet. But there is an ESP32-S2 and ESP32-S3 reverse TFT feather wing, uh, which just mounts the uh, panel differently to make it better or for putting within something. Uh, and the ESP32-S2 matrix portal, um, which is a replacement for the matrix portal that uses the hard to obtain Atmel SAMD51 microcontroller. And I think we'll just actually be a better, more reliable, more capable product. So I'm particularly excited about that one. Uh, I really hope it makes it through and becomes a product. All right, that is it for me. I think that's quite enough. Um, I'm gonna read notes from Seagrover and then pass the baton to Dan again. Uh, so C. Grover writes, After revisiting and refactoring the thermal camera code, I began to notice opportunities to apply MicroLab to improve time-critical routines in other projects. This led to the discovery that DisplayIO.Group and DisplayIO.Palette object don't support slice objects, even though they act, act as lists. I'm going to test and contemplate, contemplate this a bit more... Bleh. I'm going to test and contemplate this a little bit more before sub submitting an issue. This could be a game changer for quickly changing properties such as position and color for a subset of group objects such as game sprites or thermal grid, thermal camera grid displays. Apparently it doesn't actually help to have complete sentences. I still stumble over reading your notes. Uh, all right, next up from C. Grover, developing a generic quote, fail over library for portal devices to place a screen or matrix display into a low power mode instead of a bright REPL screen when encountering a fatal error, all in an effort to reduce display-generated heat. It's especially critical for unattended TFTs in tight enclosures or in general for RGB LED matrix displays. All right, next up is Dan, and then I'll read some notes from some other people. Okay, uh, in the last week I did a lot of reviews. Uh, that's been true. We, thanks for everybody. We have more contributors than ever. It's terrific. Uh, last week, I met with Scott to catch up on things. Um, I fixed an STM PW out bug just this morning after working on it all weekend. Um, it was an obscure case where, well, PW out sometimes was either running at half frequency or double frequency, and this was extremely confusing. I thought it was some kind of code bug, but it turned to be an off, out to be an off by one bug. We returned the timer number as zero based in one case and used it as one based somewhere else. Uh, STM numbers them starting at one. I don't really know why, but they do. And so once I figured that out, it's fixed. Um, I fixed an error in RP2040 pin alarms where when you set up the alarm, it was triggerable even before you slept. And so if it triggered at that time, it wouldn't get reset. And when you went into sleep, it wouldn't wake up when you triggered the, the pin alarm. So that's fixed. Um, remember, we talked earlier. I'm not sure if we talked during the meeting, but Mac OS Ventura 13.0 or later has a problem copying things to the fake UF2 drives like you would find on Adafruit boards with UF2 bootloaders or on the Raspberry Pi Pico, and there are some other boards that do that too, like the Microbit. And you can't drag a UF2 in the finder to uh, the drive, you get an error. So this is documented in um, a blog post that we did just for Ventura in the blog posts. 
uh, I discovered a user found that unfortunately for the NRF 52 boards, this problem is even worse. You could work around it by using the command line to copy the file instead of the finder, but on the NRF 52 boards, there's something about how their bootloader is implemented that causes them to not work at all, even with the command line. Like, uh, the board will think that it has been disconnected from USB after only a second or two, which is really bad. So, and it's hard to upgrade the bootloaders on those boards. So we really need Apple to fix this. So if you are affected by this problem, please read our blog post and report your problem to Apple because the more people who complain, the more uh, squeaky wheel will get the grease, we hope. Okay, that's it. All right, I have a whole pile of notes from DJ Devon 3 and from David uh, Glowed before we get to Foamy Guy. So, DJ Devon 3 writes, uh, finished up PR changes in my Adafruit requests API examples. Foamy Guy streamed while reviewing my PR and I learned some new things. Using string replace instead of regex means one less library. It was a great experience having my PR reviewed during a live stream. Can highly recommend it. I learned a lot. Foamy Guy seemed interested in having a Twitch API example, so as a thank you for helping me through the PR, I dove into that last night. Running into zero auth issues, hoping to have it working and a PR submitted for it later next week. Um, made a good amount of progress on my TR cowbell sequencer thanks to Naradoc. He completely rewrote the code and he added async IO and he did it blind without having my board in his hands. He's getting proper credit for his contribution in the GitHub project page. After looking at the code he wrote, I would never have gotten it. I wasn't even close. Bravo Naradoc and thank you. Went through the eye of Hurricane Nicole. It was inconsequential as I was on the weak side of the eye wall, didn't even lose power. Hope Ann Barella and Ruiz brothers made it through unscathed. Due to the hurricane, I picked up a battery powered Weller soldering iron, shot a YouTube video on it that shows me almost setting a surge protector on fire. There was smoke and I wasn't kind about the design flaw of an untethered soldering iron being able to roll around. Was inspired by Sophie Wong's designs after watching her talk at the Hackaday Supercon on YouTube. Ended up making cyber ski goggles. The silicon jackets on nudes do not stick to hot glue, it's like trying to glue Teflon, so you have to go over the filament and tack it down. Results would be cleaner with a custom 3D printed housing. You can run nudes without a resistor and they're much brighter as you can see in the image. The red nudes have a 68 ohm resistor, which is just enough to have a visible difference. It's running pulsing animation, so I'm not worried about them burning out. And next up, I have notes from David Glode. Investigating Mastodon, and they've put their Mastodon handle there in the notes doc, and trying to figure out where to do my microblogging, build an alternate network, and recover slash convert my Twitter archive. Making the sensorless Zhao NRF board easier to find, it uses the same UF2 as the Zhao NRF Sense on circuitpython.org. Building two Adafruit.io temperature sensors with MCP9808, one with a Pi portal and one with PicoW to monitor internal and external temperature of an extension of my home. And there is a link to uh, David's Mastodon in the notes doc. Failure to make it work with Whippersnapper, uh, not available on PicoW, so I use CircuitPython. Trying to figure out the quality of the isolation and thermal behavior with various heater settings. And finally, investigating how to use my new radar, 24 gigahertz millimeter wave sensor human stationary presence. It has a UART protocol with checksum and the only driver is in C for Arduino, so guess I will have to do it myself. All right, next up are Foamy Guy and then Katni. So go ahead, Tim. All right, thanks, Jeff. Um couple of uh, things I got into over the past week, uh, tested and reviewed the um, different API examples in the request library. Uh, thank you to DJ Devin, submitted that one. Um, implemented in the core, uh, a hidden property for the vector IO shapes. Um, so like groups and bitmaps and on-disk bitmaps, they all have, uh, tile grids I should say, they all have a hidden property that you can use to hide and show them. Uh, vector IO shapes did not used to. You could put them in a group and hide the group, um, but uh, with the PR that I submitted, you can actually hide them directly without having to use the parent group. Um, 
I uh, tested out a couple of your uh, improvements that you submitted recently uh, for LED animations. The one in the library, we tried that out uh, this past weekend. I think it was on Saturday. And then uh, this morning, I tried out the core one that replaces the um, pixel map class. Um, I got to say also, it was very insightful to see the different pieces of code that are involved in implementing that class inside the core. It's was really helpful, I think, and will be. Um, I'll refer back to it a couple of times. It will be helpful to see an example of a class that's written in the core that also has Python code available, so I can look back and forth, and um, one kind of helps me understand the, uh, the other. So that was cool to get a look at. Uh, and then before the meeting today, I was working on getting the tools needed to run circuitpython.org up and running, like Ruby and Jekyll and however it serves and that sort of stuff. So I uh, got that stuff up and running earlier today to do some reviews on that PR, uh, on that uh, repo as well. Thanks. Thank you. And next up is Katni. After that, I will read notes from some folks. All right. Thanks, Jeff. So last week, I put the Pi Cowbell proto guide in moderation. Um, that guide is uh, fairly simple. Um, it was quite involved for me. Uh, there's four or five rather assembly pages to show you uh, how to put headers on the Pico itself and then um, the four different ways that you can assemble the Pi Cowbell. And because the pins along each side, uh, the, the length of those uh, strips are the same, it's very easy to install it backwards or upside down. So there was a lot of um, ref you know, pictures referring to that and, and warnings and so on. So uh, that bit was a little involved because there were six to eight photos for each assembly page. Um, so it took longer than I expected. Um, I also, on Friday, workshops adding a few things to the Adafruit Community Code of Conduct. Um, in the process of adding the, the couple new things which were discussed on, uh, came up via Discord um, previously, uh, we also found a lot of changes that should be made to that were that were probably in the original that I adapted it from, but no longer really applied to us. So there's some non-functional and formatting changes as well, and that will go in as a pull request, uh, which I will link in the CircuitPython Dash Dev channel on the Adafruit Discord. Um, so if folks are interested in that, they can check that out. And so that was last week. This week, I'll be meeting with Liz about some questions she has about hosting this meeting and about when we want to do a couple guides that we're both working on. Uh, continue the Adafruit Community Code of Conduct updates, uh, which is to say there's a second piece to that update, which is adding a document that covers the update process. It will explain how we come up with ideas and then do a PR so that the community can contribute. And then once that is you know, more or less approved by the community, um, then it gets added to the code of conduct itself. Um, it as basically this, this part came out of the fact that we are now using the code of conduct. Um, folks have to agree to it to be able to make a user page on the uh, Adafruit learn system. And my concern was that we do update the code of conduct from time to time. And so if someone checked that box, you know, a year ago, and then comes to us now and says, well, when I agreed to it, that wasn't on there. You can't ban me or something to that effect. Um, we needed to make it clear to folks that they that they should be aware that it is updated and from time to time and possibly take a look at it again. Um, and within that, I wanted to explain exactly how that update process worked so that if those people are, you know, upset that it's updated or something, maybe can, actually being able to be part of the update process would help with that. Um, so that's where all of that came from. I think the update process document will get added as a separate um, pull request because there's already a number of changes in the first one. Uh, the next product guide I'll be doing is the Quick Stemma Hub Breakout. Uh, just a little breakout with a lot of Stemma connectors on it. Um, then I need to decide what's after that, which is part of, I kind of want to do a project guide, uh, which means talking to Liz about what her order of operations is because the two that I have we're working together on. Um, my list is totally massive, so I will not run out of things to do, even if uh, we have to shift things around. Um, and I'll be out a little early tomorrow for going out to dinner. This past weekend, I finalized, quote unquote, the code for a personal project, which is to say it will almost certainly be updated right quick. Um, it parses an RSS feed, 
uh, and takes a few pieces of data, generates a dynamic string, and then sends the string to Twitter and Mastodon. And this is all written in Python. Um, it includes customization such as disabling Twitter, Mastodon, or both. It now has error checking for authorization failure. It also includes checking to ensure it does not post duplicate messages if the script is run and no new data has been added to the RSS feed. And I included the GitHub link to that um, in my notes. And I'll post it to Discord in a moment here. And that's what I've got. That sounds like plenty. All right, next up I have some notes to read. And after that, I will uh, be giving the floor to Paul. But right now, maker Melissa writes, Last week, cleared out remaining platform detect PRs that were in limbo, fixed an issue with the web serial ESP tool trying to deploy twice and overwriting files, reviewed lots of circuitpython.org PRs, fixed the Adafruit Python shell library's run command function so it's not locking up occasionally, merged in some waiting Raspberry Pi installer script PRs, started working on converting Raspberry Pi installer scripts once again from shell to Python, it's weird how those Python scripts just turn back into shell scripts. Um, updated learn guides that were still using some of the old scripts. A request for a review of two PRs which have been waiting for almost a couple of weeks. Uh, so if you are inclined to review a circuitpython.org pull request, uh, maybe take a look at those two links. This week, more shell script conversions. Meet with Scott to talk about working on code.circuitpython.org and uh, we'll probably move over to working on code.circuitpython.org some more. Then I've got notes from Mark, aka Gamblor. Uh, reassembled my giant 300 pixel NeoPixel display. Looking at NeoPixel 8 for num strands less than 8. Needs some tweaks with how the data is passed to the PIO program. Um, I hope you didn't spend too much time on that, Mark, because actually I was working on that as well. Um, and had a random thought about making a NeoPixel frame buffer core module similar to RGB matrix and IS31FL3741 frame buffers. If anyone has thoughts on this, good or bad, please let me know. All right, then we've got Paul. So go ahead, Paul. Good job. A uh, new episode of the CircuitPython show is out today with Joey Castillo as the guest. He and I had a great chat talking about a couple of his products and how he's used CircuitPython to prototype them as well as low power and deep sleep with CircuitPython. And then last week, I also wrote a slash modified a Python app to create transcriptions and subtitles that I can use with the podcast. Thanks. That's very cool. All right, I've got notes from Tammy Makes Things and then uh, from Tanu, uh, I'll turn it over to. All right, so Tammy writes, been super slammed with work stuff for the past couple of weeks. We're kicking off a new big project. So I haven't had time to do a lot and have been absent from the past couple of meetings. Uh, but this week, looking at what's required to add support for NRPN messages to Adafruit MIDI, and looking at whether I can implement the Mastodon API on CircuitPython enough to make a Mastodon scrolling latest toot board. And we're happy to see you when you have the time, Tammy, and we understand life and work are always ready to interfere with our fun stuff like CircuitPython and Mastodon. Anyway. Uh, go ahead, Scott. What's up? Hello. Thanks, Jeff. So I'm back from 12 weeks of paternity slash bonding leave. Um, Ari, my baby, <laughs> can now crawl. He has four teeth. He's got the bottom two are fully in, and then the top two are coming in, which is real pleasant, let me tell you. Teething's fun. Um, he can pick up food and, and put it in his mouth and eat it, which is... Uh, all these things that you that I do every day that I don't realize that I had to learn is is fun to watch. Uh, he loves to stand on his feet with help and grab everything and anything to put in his mouth. Um, I wanted to put a bullet point in there because bonding, paternity, and and taking care of your kids is important. Um, okay, so on the in the terms of what things I played around with while Ari was was asleep. Um, I had some quote-unquote hobby projects. Uh, the very first one was getting CircuitPython running on the Bangle JS2, which is a, a watch that we, shell, that we sell in the Adafruit shop. Um, it's by the Esprino folks, which is kind of like the JavaScript version of uh, like MicroPython, CircuitPython. So it's like embedded version of JavaScript. 
Um, but I've got it running uh, CircuitPython, and it shows the time and the most recent important notification, where important is uh, kind of encoded in the CircuitPython code. Um, so I've been using that uh, as my daily watch uh, for the whole 12 weeks, basically. So I've got uh, some outstanding code that I'm, I'm going to need to get in, and uh, then we'll have it, and folks should be able to use it, uh, hopefully, um, which will be really fun. I think we've talked a lot about doing a CircuitPython watch, and, and I'm pretty happy with this. Um, after that, I spent, not, not tech-related, but I did spend some time doing analysis on the Seattle City Council redistricting alternatives, and there was a, an article in the kind of more... Uh, liberal, okay using cuss words, <laughs> uh, kind of online newspaper there about my involvement in that, if you want to check that out. Um, I will be putting the Bengal.js 2 into the CircuitPython repo. Keith is excited about heart rate monitor, but I have to warn you, I don't have heart rate monitor working, and I don't have the touch screen working. It shouldn't be too bad, but um, I haven't played around with either of those things. Um... I spent some time playing with FPGAs, which folks will probably know is something that kind of catches my interest from time to time. I really tried to focus on the Orange Crab, which is a, is a board that is an FPGA base, but it's in a feather form factor. I got interested in RISC-V cores. That got me distracted in RISC-V debug support, um, and Pi OCD is, is pretty neat, but is Cortex-M only right now, so I'd love to find some time to add RISC-V support to Pi OCD, which I vastly prefer over the uh, multitude of open OCD forks. Um, thanks to Luke W, who also works for Raspberry Pi and has their own Hazard 3 core, so I learned some stuff there. And the RISC-V Pi OCD support could also apply to the ESP32 C3 because it does have kind of standard uh, RISC-V debug spec uh, support. Um, Another side note here that I didn't write down, but uh, OpenOCD has a, a, a remote bitbang protocol, which is just like an ASCII protocol over a socket um, that is like very easy to write a quick CircuitPython script to basically be the, the thing that actually bitbangs the pins. So potentially for us, it, it would be a way for anyone in the community to have access to JTAG and SWD, basically. Um, it would just not be particularly fast, but it would be something that you could even do over like an ESP Wi-Fi connection, which would be kind of neat. Um, so that's something to think about. Um, another thing I've been thinking about, I don't see Kmatch in the meeting, but uh, Kmatch did a ton of work about having an easy open source logic analyzer firmware for, for all the, these dev boards. Um, he did a lot of work to get it working in SIGROC, but the SIGROC project isn't in a good state. It's got like two core repos and they both have 50 plus open issues uh, or open PRs in GitHub. And the only person who's a maintainer, as far as I can tell, doesn't like using GitHub. So it's kind of in a bad space. So my brain's thinking about what a better alternative for that in the future is. Um, and then another project I was thinking about is uh, a, a project to control a baby monitor from CircuitPython. This is basically inspired by, like, he wakes up in the middle of the night and cries for, like, two minutes, but then manages to fall back asleep. So I want to be able to use CircuitPython to tell when he's crying. I want to log it locally, but then I also want to say, like, leave the monitor muted until he cries for, like, X minutes, and then turn it on so that he wakes us up if we're not already awake. Um, but as you can tell, I, I get distracted by rabbit holes of these projects. Um, one thing I've thought a lot about is having a programmable STEMI QT, so a, a, a board that you would program over I squared C. Uh, I've thought about this in terms of FPGAs, but FPGAs are really expensive. I discovered the lowest, like basically the lowest end of the STM32 G0 series. Uh, it's a cheap Cortex M0 Plus. Think kind of like a Sandy 21, but not the side that we run CircuitPython, but like the smaller side of like 8K RAM and 32K flash. Um, they're 80 cents in singles off JLC, JLC PCB, and they get even cheaper if you buy more. Um, the cool thing is STM's boot ROM, which all of their chips have as far as I know, 
um, support uh, I squared C bootloading. Um, so the you could actually load like ARM assembly code and treat it in my mind kind of like a PIO, but it's a separate chip. Um, and it's also kind of in the vein of um, what's the name for it? The SAMD nines um, seesaw. seesaw. Like, yeah, exactly. So it's it's similar to Seesaw as well, but my approach would be to what I'm imagining is that we would have CircuitPython libraries that are wrapped up and basically ship with binary code along with it, where the the Python library would load the code to the device and then treat it as just another I squared C device that it's talking to, like an I, I squared C peripheral. Um, so I have a design for that that I ordered from JLC PCB assembled, um, which is pretty neat, and it was only like thirty bucks for five of them, which is pretty wild. Um, that should arrive on Thursday, so I, I do want to pull that thread because um, Lamore and I were talking. We we talked a bit over my leave because we wouldn't weren't gonna necessarily overlap, um, and she mentioned that JLC PCB could be a good way to prototype or even like put a first batch of boards into the store um, because their, their assembly is pretty inexpensive. Um, so I did it all through J JLC PCB assembly. Um, and uh, yeah, so that will arrive on Thursday and I'm interested in, in pulling con continuing down that path. Um, I did get slightly distracted a few days ago. Um, so there's this GDB plugin called PyCortex MD bug, which allows you to use like an, an SVD command to look at all the registers of different peripherals. I usually manage the SVD file myself, but there is a SimSys pack manager thing that PyOCD uses um, that includes SVDs in it. So I was looking into adding support to the GDB plugin for using that pack manager because I already had, I had downloaded it for PyOCD, but I didn't have access to it from this other tool. So. I was taking a look at, at that as well. Um, this is all kind of backgrounding stuff, but I thought I would talk about it now in case folks are interested. Okay, so back to my CircuitPython life. Um, the goal this week is to get caught up on communications. I've got like, I don't know, like 2,000 unread emails. Um, I'm going to be heavily skimming. Um, so if there are things that you think I should look at or you want to chat with me about, please let me know. Um, I'm really in kind of information gathering mode right now is to decide like both where my work, what my work becomes, but also um, kind of what priorities for the project as a whole will be um, going, especially as Phil and Lamar are out. Um, things I definitely know I want to do, uh, I do want to get the Bangle.js 2 stuff in um, so that you could have a Bangle.js and you could load CircuitPython on it. Um, it's been actually, I, I know I'm taking a while, so no problem. tell me Take if I'm time. talking enough. It is a 12-week update, to be fair. Um, one interesting thing to note about the Bangle.js 2 stuff is there's no USB. So all of the programming that I've been doing for the watch has been over, um, over BLE. So I've been using the BLE workflow a lot, and that's been really interesting to see kind of what is neat and what is... Um, what works and what doesn't work. Generally, it works quite well. I've been pretty happy with it. Uh, REPL access is something that would be really nice, um, but I have an idea. Like, there's a way to do that um, pretty simply using the existing Bluefruit app. Uh, we just need one change to it because the Bluefruit app supports um, the Nordic UART service, which is basically what we implement, except for the fact that we change the UUIDs so that if the user wants to use it, they can use it. Um, so it should be a pretty simple fix to Bluefruit so that it will support the other one as well. Um, I heard wind that TAC might be working on this, but I do want to finish USB host support, um, which like I did a lot of the work for, but then we needed tiny USB, and now we've got that as well. Or like the tiny USB stuff has been done, and I want to make sure that CircuitPython uh, gets that work supported as well. Um, and then of the last but not least thing is that 8.0 is still beta, and I want to chat with everyone here to talk about uh, bug prioritization and getting that stabilized.
hopefully, I don't know, by the end of the year would be good. I don't know if there's anything super, super big. Anyway, that's an update for me. Please reach out if you have uh, thoughts about that you think I can help with. And that's it. All right. Thank you, Scott. Uh, I have one last set of notes to read, and then we will wrap up status updates. So Tectric writes, last week, finished patching all the issues resulting from the CI upgrade to allow use of Python 3.11. Started work on a command line tool called Circ Firm that will make installing versions of CircuitPython UF2 very simple. I'm hoping it will be a complement to Circa. Played whack-a-mole with Adabot as various checks have been updated and the PyPI stats edition continues to evolve. And finally, reviewed PRs now that the CI is sorted out for them. This week, uh, Tectric will continue to watch for issues resulting from updates made to libraries to fix PyLint issues. I don't foresee any issues, but please let me know if something doesn't seem like it's working. Uh, to continue working on Circ Firm and begin writing documentation and instructions. And Tectric is taking some personal time for a family wedding this weekend, so it may be a light week. And that finishes up status updates, which uh, took fully 35 minutes because there was a lot of stuff, um, which is really exciting. Anyway, we do have a couple of topics for In the Weeds. I'd like to thank people for adding their topics there. And um, I will hand these off to the people who uh, created the topics to talk about them. So uh, Deshapu, would you care to go ahead, please? Okay, so this is just an idea I had some time ago. And I thought I would just throw it out there. I do realize that this change, uh, while it doesn't really change, the mechanism underneath is a lot, a, a big change because all the documentation and all the examples would need to be changed, but uh, maybe it's worth it anyways. So the, the thing is, there is a lot of uh, confusion from people coming for help to do the uh, Python, help with Circuit Python panel about how display IO works. I suspect this is partly because they are uh, used to a frame buffer based uh, model where, where you just have to repaint everything every turn. But I, I uh, also suspect that the show function that we have in there uh, doesn't like dispel that uh, mental model from them. And uh, I noticed we already have the root group uh, property on the display. And uh, basically all that the show method does is to assign that root group. So I, I thought maybe if we remove this show method, uh, at least in the documentation, and use an assignment to the root group instead, that would make it a little bit more obvious for, for people new to display I.O. how it actually works, that the show doesn't actually refresh the display, that it only assigns the root group. Uh, so that's just a, a idea for an API change. And uh, it's it would be a costly change uh, in terms of changing all the documentation and possibly breaking people's code later when the so uh, method is completely removed, but maybe it's worth it. That's 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 it. The the other idea I just had is we could make show do a refresh, right? Uh, it still doesn't doesn't uh, help with this uh, thing where people expect it to like. I've seen people create a new group every frame <laughs> yeah. and populate it with the things they want to display because that's how you would do with uh, right. Canvas in JavaScript, for instance. Right. Uh, so so uh, I'm not sure that that would actually help. Yeah. Right. So, so yeah, and, and I, I would uh, say, really don't people... want to... I would really don't want to change what... The, function does like it yeah. would still have to assign the the root group right apart yeah, from I, doing show i think this is interesting have you opened an issue for this yes of course okay great 
sorry, I, I'm not caught up on the issues. I think it's a good idea. Yeah, I think if the if setting the property is equivalent to calling the function, we've always kind of favored setting a property um, just as the way we do things in CircuitPython. So, although I, I, I initially was misunderstanding what it was because uh, I was confusing show and update, I think that illustrates actually that this that doing this change might be a good insight. Anyway, so yes, please do file that bug so we can discuss it more at length, but I think it kind of makes sense as a different, at least what to propose people write. Um, anyway, so yeah, thank you. Uh, and then our other item is from Moto Timo. So please take it away and let us know what's on your mind. Yeah, so, you know, these are the communities that I uh, do for my day job and a lot of my hobby work as well. So um, I just wanted to invite folks to the Yakta Project Summit. That's going to be remote or a virtual uh, November 29th to the 1st of December. So it's like $40, I believe. And, you know, this is the higher end, uh, you know, application processors. So it's, it's regular embedded Linux, but there, we also do Zephyr and free RTOS and things like that. Uh, and then Boston is coming up in um, February and that's in Brussels, uh, always in Brussels. And we're, I'm on the open embedded board, and so we have a open embedded workshop the day after FOSDEM. And we're really looking for other interesting topics for the workshop, and I think folks would really be interested in hearing about Cricut Python and MicroPython and things like that. Uh, all of our tool chains are all based on Python anyway, so BitBake and other tools that we have are all Python based. So I think it's a good opportunity for folks in this community to cross pollinate. And that's it. All right, thank you. Uh, David asks, is the Open Embedded Workshop also in Brussels? Yes, it's really close to the, uh, to the same university. It's, it's around the corner. All right, uh, so people should look for a call for proposals soon uh, for Open Embedded, is that? Yeah, I put the link there. It's just not live yet. Um, okay. So it will show up. I mean, I, I can see it because I'm, you know, on the board, but it's not live yet, so All right, it could well, be today or tomorrow. Cool. Do um, paste those links into the channel. Um, you may have to do a little pause between them for the link cool down, but uh, just to give more people access to that. Uh, we really appreciate the invitation, and I hope somebody in our community can take you up on it. Yeah, that'd be great. All right. Uh, well, now it's time to wrap up the meeting. It's been really nice spending some time with you all. And I just need to get back to my um, notes for how I wrap up. Uh, this has been the CircuitPython Weekly for Monday, November 14, 2022. Thank you to everyone who participated, uh, especially those of you who we haven't seen in a while. It's nice to catch up. Uh, if you want to support Adafruit and CircuitPython and those of us that work on CircuitPython, consider purchasing from the Adafruit shop at adafruit.com. The video of this meeting will be going up on YouTube at youtube.com slash Adafruit, and from there we will release the podcast on major podcast services. It will also be featured in the Python for Microcontrollers newsletter. Visit adafruitdaily.com to subscribe. The next meeting will be held uh, on Monday as usual at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific. That's November 21st. Um, the meeting is held on the Adafruit Discord, which you can join anytime by going to adafru.it slash discord. To be notified about the meeting and any changes to the time or day, you can be asked to be added to the CircuitPythonistas role on Discord. And uh, that's basically it. We hope to see you all next week. Thanks, everybody, and have a great week. Thanks, everyone.